The ability to count and keep track of quantities of things, be it inventory, people, or numbers themselves, is something that we humans do from a very young age. And we also learn the ability to manipulate quantities of things using various rules. And we call this ability mathematical ability. And like all cognitively demanding abilities like language, writing, abstract thought, and problem solving, it is thought to be dependent on functions of the brain. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about the neuroscience of mathematical ability. So first, I'm going to cover what math is and how we treat math, or that is to say, how we actually go about doing math. Then we'll take a jump into the brain and cover how the brain deals with numbers and quantity, and then how it performs complex calculations with these numbers. So what is math? Well, most people have a fairly intuitive sense of what math is and what it's for, uh, seeing as how we've been taught it most of our lives. But we can more formally define math as the abstract science of number, quantity, and space. Mathematics may be studied in its own right, like pure mathematics, or as it is applied to other disciplines such as physics and engineering. Through the use of abstraction and logic, mathematics comes from simple number observations and manipulations like counting, calculation, and measurement. Mathematics can also involve shapes and motions of physical objects like in geometry and topography. Uh, math can also range from fairly simple things uh, to things that require more formal training to comprehend. Now actually doing mathematics involves a number of different skills, and these are things like short-term memory, problem solving, abstraction, comparison, reading and writing, memorization, and application of rules. And so based on these types of behaviors, we can make the assumption that much mathematical ability is probably going to depend on the neocortex. Now a lot of this video is going to cover the neocortex, so we're going to do a, a quick overview before we get started. The neocortex is a thin layer of neurons or nerve cells that covers the outer area of our brains, along with all other mammals. It is thought to be the most developed and evolutionarily new brain structure. Because it's new, it is thought to be critically involved in a number of uniquely mammalian, or in some cases, uniquely human behaviors, like language, planning, and as we'll soon see, number processing. It has a fairly well-defined and specifically organized structure to it. In humans, it is heavily folded, like you see in the pictures, into what are called sulci, or valleys, and gyri, or ridges. And this is important when we talk about cortical brain regions, because the landscape of these valleys and ridges, ridges has been named anatomically, kind of like how we would name mountains and valleys on the surface of the Earth. All the sulci and gyri are pretty much present in most healthy people and differ usually only in their size, cell number, and level of connectedness with other areas. And so, the cortical map becomes very useful, especially when we consider that each area of the cortex usually has a defined function or set of functions. In this way, we can say that the medial prefrontal cortex does this, the inferior temporal lobe does that, and so on, and this will hold true for most people. The function of certain pieces of the cortex is largely dependent on the type of information that feeds into it and where that information comes from. Cortex that receives information that originates from the eyes is appropriately called the visual cortex. And so from here, we can start to discuss the areas of the cortex involved in number processing and calculations. Now before we get into math, we have to talk about something a little bit more fundamental uh, to math itself and that's understanding number and what numbers are and what they mean. Psychologically, we refer to this as number sense, or the ability to know that one number is smaller or bigger than another number. To know that there are more things or objects over here than there are over here. Now this is not something that we have to learn, but is argued that we have an innate ability to measure quantity, given that you know babies and monkeys can tell the difference between amounts of things as well. Numerical quantity is processed and represented in a brain region called the intraparietal sulcus, seen here as this red stripe on the left side of the brain. The intraparietal sulcus codes for number independent of modality or language. Basically what this means is that whether you're a language-speaking adult or non-language-speaking child or even a monkey, 
Whether you see the number, hear the number, or see a number of objects, the intraparietal salsus will be involved in figuring out how much you have. How do we know that the intraparietal salsus does this? Well, two pieces of evidence can be brought up. The first is through fMRI results. An fMRI is a device that can measure blood flow to specific brain areas in real time, and that blood flow is an indirect measure of brain activity. When brain cells are highly active, they require more oxygen, which can only get to those brain areas in one way, and that's through the blood. So you take a person, you put them in an fMRI, and ask them to do a bunch of math or number-related problems. And the intraparietal salsus is consistently activated. In fact, most of what I talk about in this video comes from fMRI studies looking at what brain areas are active when we do different types of math. The second involves sticking very tiny probes, called electrodes, into the brains of monkeys and training them on number games. This tiny electrode will measure brain cells when they fire and activate. And when you stick these electrodes into the intraparietal salsas of monkeys, they activate when the monkey does something in a game that requires number sense, like choosing between two different numbers in a simple math question. In fact, this has been done to the extent that people now think that individual brain cells in the intraparietal salsus may be tuned to certain numbers. What this means is that when it comes to very simple math and very simple uh, quantity and number comparisons, there will be some neurons that will be active only when the number 5 is used. They are, in a very loose sense, 5 cells. We can then begin to imagine how a brain area, like the intraparietal salsus, might make sense of numbers by encoding number representations that it could compare with each other and also within itself, as well as sending those number signals to other brain areas involved in mathematical calculation. And because the intraparietal salsus is a number comparator, it is also functionally relevant to subtraction and addition. Now, as we'll find out throughout the rest of this video, brain areas, especially cortical brain areas, rarely ever have just one single defined function, but they usually have multiple functions depending on the types of inputs that get sent to them. So uh, another function of the intraparietal salsus is visual spatial short-term memory. Now basically what that means is that it's functionally involved in holding on to information for short periods of time, information that is about what you see in your environment in space. Uh, and if you ask me, that sounds like it would be pretty useful in understanding and making sense of equations that you look at and read. But before we talk about the other brain areas involved in calculation, uh, we first need to talk about one of the primary neuroscientific theories about how we actually do math, because how we do math will determine where in the brain we do it. So let me explain. Some have argued that math is done in a very similar way that language is done, that is, treating mathematical equations the same way we would treat sentences and words, that when alone mean nothing, but when placed together in order can be used to create meaning. Also, math can be spoken and heard, and how our brains listen and speak, which involves our mouths and ears, is not the same thing as how we read and write, which involves our eyes and hands. All of these things are going to play a very important role in how our brain does math, which is what has led to a very prominent theory in mathematical cognition, that is, the triple circuit theory. Proposed by Dehene and Cohen in 1977, it goes something like this. Mathematical understanding can be expressed in multiple different ways, as a string of digits or letters, kind of like writing, as verbal spoken sentences, or as quantities and magnitudes. If you read and write math, you would activate brain regions that are also active in reading and writing language. If you speak and explain math out loud, you would activate language areas. And when you make judgments about the size of two numbers, you would activate number sense regions like we've already talked about. What this means is that when doing math, what you do and how you do it will determine where in your brain you do it. With this in mind, I'm now going to cover what we know about mathematical calculation in the brain and most of the associated brain areas involved. Now, to avoid this you know, video turning into some big long list of anatomical jargon that you're not familiar with, I'm going to divide it up uh, into two distinct mathematical systems, and then once we've covered that, uh, we'll go over the implications of these brain areas and how they influence how we do math in two distinct ways. That is, spatially, in space, and language. The first thing I'm going to talk about is what we will call retrieval math. Uh, 
What this means is that sometimes when we do math, we don't actually do any real math. We simply apply previously learned rules to solve fairly simple problems. For example, when most people do 5 times 5, they don't really count it out in their heads. They just know from memorization that the answer is 25. So the retrieval math system will involve using verbal and sometimes called semantic memory when solving problems. So first, we know that the intraparietal solstice is involved in number sense, and so it's usually active during all mathematical calculations, despite how they're done. The second structure we're going to be talking about is the angular gyrus. Uh, and we can see it here in green. The angular gyrus is located, not surprisingly, very close to the intraparietal solstice, just below it. The angular gyrus has been associated with a number of things, including language and attention, but for our purposes, multiplication and verbal memory. Uh, how it is thought to do this is that when it comes to language, the angular gyrus plays a critical role in learning words and language rules verbally. Uh, together with another brain area called the supramarginal gyrus, seen here, which is located right next to it, the angular gyrus can attach meanings to words, or in the case of math, meanings to simple equations like 7 times 7 means 49. And so, when it comes to doing math, the angular gyrus will take these memories of mathematical rules that it has acquired and apply the rules to whatever problem you happen to be doing. In this case, very simple multiplication. And as we know, multiplication isn't something that people really figure out intuitively on their own, like number sense, but it is instead to be learned through practice and memorization via the times tables. And this is where the angular gyrus and the supermarginal gyrus will come in. Taken together, these three areas, the intraparietal solstice, the angular gyrus, and the supermarginal gyrus, will take observed sets of numbers and short mathematical equations determine the size or values that each symbol in the equation represents, and then it will retrieve mathematical facts or rules previously learned, and they will come up with an answer. Now, slightly more exciting is the second system we'll talk about, which we will call procedural math, or real-time math, or figuring out new math problems uh, that are bigger than, you know, 4 plus 3 or 5 times 5. Problems that require much more complicated thinking in real time. So first, we will talk about the anterior cingulate gyrus, located on the medial, or inside wall, of the cortex. The anterior part is the most forward part, seen here. The anterior cingulate cortex is a very popular brain region of study, and it has a lot of functions associated with it. But the few ones that we're going to be interested in are error processing, performance monitoring, action selection, and controlled value judgments. Now these are, you know, neuroscience terms, so let's break them down into something a little bit simpler. Error processing can be thought of as how we think about what is right and wrong. Not morally right and wrong, but factually right and wrong. It involves thinking about whether or not the thing that we've just done will work out or not. Action selection is, well, selecting which thing we should do. Controlling value judgments is when we determine how valuable a certain thing we do will eventually turn out to be. And performance monitoring is evaluating ourselves doing these things as we do them. Taken together, we might think of the anterior cingulate gyrus as being a brain region that looks at uh, information that it takes in about possible options, determines whether or not they're good or bad, and then picks one. We can imagine ourselves doing this when it comes to large mathematical equations. The bed mass rule, or brackets, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction, uh, is being a good example of this. We analyze our equation, then we pick the proper step to do next, figuring out if it will work or not as we do it. And the anterior cingulate cortex is also found to be active in fMRI scans of people doing mathematical equations. Now the prefrontal cortex is famous for being one of the shining features of the human brain. Uh, as well as other primates, because it is responsible for some of the more complex cognitive behaviors like planning, social organization, and personality. I'm going to talk about two specific functions of the prefrontal cortex, uh, and that's attention and short-term memory. Mathematics requires both attention and short-term memory uh, so that you don't lose track of what you're doing while you're doing it. You can't really do math uh, 
uh, if it's not at the forefront of your thinking, uh, and it's also very hard to do it if you forget everything you did just three seconds ago. So much of the information that is calculated during problem sets gets sent to the prefrontal cortex to stay online, if we want to use that word, to be used uh, later on in the problem. How the prefrontal cortex keeps information in short-term memory is a complicated issue, uh, but it's clear the short-term memory isn't actually stored in the, the neurons of the prefrontal cortex, but exists as a constant activity between the prefrontal cortex and other regions like the parietal lobe and the basal ganglia, possibly in loops or recurring activity circuits that keep information active until it has to be used and then is sent to some other region. The fusiform gyrus is known for two things, human face recognition and word form processing. And when it comes to math, we're more concerned with uh, this latter feature. Now what word form processing means is that a word is made up of individual pieces called letters and that each of the letters is comprised of distinct lines in a, in a relationship to one another. When your visual cortex first receives input from your eyes about the words that it sees, it doesn't just make perfect sense automatically. The brain has to process what it sees in order to make sense of it. And the fusiform gyrus will receive input from visual areas of the cortex about simple lines that make up letters and words that as visual information moves up the cortex get processed in more and more finely tuned ways so that eventually the information that your cortex initially receives about a series of disparate scattered lines on a page comes to eventually look like a meaningful word and the final product of this is proposed to happen in the fusiform gyrus at least when it comes to words and sentences now in math this would be critically important for reading equations and making sense of the symbols found in them to make sense of them as a collective meaningful whole Now, since we're talking uh, about reading, I'll also briefly cover the precentral gyrus, called so because it's located in the front of the central gyrus, this large crease uh, in the cortex here in the middle. The precentral gyrus is where the famous homunculus is located, that is, the sensory map of the entire body. And in reference to math, this part of the cortex is going to be involved in eye movements when reading. Lastly, we'll cover the inferior frontal gyrus. The inferior frontal gyrus will show activation in an fMRI when a person does mathematical calculations, just like most of these other brain regions. It has been shown to regulate visual information that gets sent to the parietal regions, like we first talked about. Uh, it's involved in visual working memory, uh, as well as determining task difficulty and choosing strategies based on that difficulty. So it might be involved in picking simple solutions when doing mathematical calculations. So to recap on what we've just covered, there is a system of brain regions that will retrieve previously learned mathematical rules uh, to solve problems, and then there's another system of brain regions that can look at an equation, break it down into its individual pieces, decide what to do first, how to do it, uh, all in a way that will solve the problem as a collective meaningful whole. Now I'm going to be talking about uh, math from two different perspectives. After reviewing the procedural math system, we also find that some of the areas that are unique to mathematics, areas like the fusiform gyrus, angular and supramarginal gyrus, precentral gyrus, and inferior frontal gyrus are also involved in reading. And so from this, we can conclude that much of solving mathematical equations is like reading sentences and making sense of language. And this is how many people think about and study uh, the neuroscience of math. Um, and as we've covered with the fusiform gyrus, um, it can take individual pieces of a thing, like letters, and form meaningful words. Um, how you self-monitor a math equation would be no different from how you would self-monitor with reading, using the anterior cingulate gyrus, like we talked about. Um, and in fact, the inferior frontal lobe contains a brain region called Broca's area, a brain region critical for the formation of spoken language and planning all of the movements necessary for creating speech, like I'm doing right now. And if Broca's area is damaged in your brain, uh, then a person will express speech uh, that does not really have good grammar uh, and will most likely be incomprehensible, just drivel. Much of how we do math is identical to the same way that we do language. Um, however, 
far more interesting, at least I think, is the overlap between math and spatial cognition. Many of the brain areas that we've talked about also have spatial functions. For example, so what we're looking at here is if you took the intraparial salsus, which remember is a kind of valley of nervous tissue in the cortex, and you opened it up, you unfolded it, and uh, this is where its respective subregions would be. So in the intraparial salsus, the lateral intraparietal part, or the outside most part, is involved in using reference points to center the eye's position and fixation. Basically, the ability to fixate on a point and follow objects in space. The ventral part, however, or the VIP, is used for head-centered frame of reference to contrast with the position of the eyes. The anterior part, or the forwardmost part, coordinates hand movements, and the caudal part processes three-dimensional shapes, that is, the overall structure of objects, and is important for guiding hand movements when grabbing three-dimensional objects. Now, we can imagine how some of these things might be important for guiding uh, hand movements and eye movements when you're reading and writing math. But, more interestingly, uh, some researchers have proposed that the overlap of function in certain brain regions, that is, math and space, uh, is what leads human beings to conceive math spatially. That is to say, this is why we have number lines, planes, graphs, charts, geometry and trigonometry, and so on. Because dealing with math in space, as opposed to some other medium, will come naturally to us. In some ways, math is a lot like language. But in other ways, it's a lot like spatial processing. The intraparietal salsus, like we've talked about, is proposed to be an innate uh, place for you know number quantity, given that it appears in monkeys and uh, pre-educated infants. But what about doing math itself, you know, something that most of us have to be taught in our formative years? Well, this leaves open uh, the possibility that our ability to become good at math is simply us training our communication, number sense, and spatial brain systems in novel ways to solve novel problems. So, here's a nice uh, infographic to recap on all the information that we've covered in this video. Now, importantly, all of the information that I've covered here is not mine. I do not have the time or the money to run hundreds of experiments. Uh, all that I've done today is uh, show you the results of hard work from neuroscientists over the years. This is simply my presentation. So if you're interested in learning more, then please check out the links and references that I've got in the low bar. And as always, thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.